webinar. Uh, it, it, it brings me immense pleasure to welcome you to this special webinar. As you may be aware, our nation is currently facing a significant challenge with the resurgence of measles cases. Earlier this year, Sri Lanka achieved the prestigious status of being declared measles eliminated. However, it is with a sense of con concern that I have to inform you that the recent emergence, there is a recent emergence of measles cases. It started off as pockets around Colombo, particularly centered around one ethnic group due to vaccine hesitancy. The media has made uh, things worse by blowing up drug reactions out of proportion. Now cases are being reported around the country at an alarming rate. Between the 1st of July and 14th of August, a total of 54 cases were reported uh, in LRH with a notable 20 cases involving infants under the age of 9 months. These figures indicate the urgency of our discussion as they directly impact the achievement of Sustainable Development Goal 3.2, which aims to reduce the child mortality under the age of 5 years. So in this, vaccination plays a major role. As you can see, our, our theme is in the wake of calamity, let no child be left behind. In fact, the incidence of measles serves as a critical indicator of the success of childhood immunization programs. In, it is compared to the historical use of canaries in coal mines, where the canaries uh, detect carbon monoxide poisoning and the uh, coal miners used to withdraw something. I mean, it is uh, akin to measles uh, in a community. This webinar will look into these vital aspects, exploring not only the current situation, but also strategic measures required to combat this research. So we have two esteemed speakers uh, lined up today for you. The first speaker needs no special introduction. Dr. BJC Perra was the founder president of the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. Then he was the founder president of the Respiratory Disease Study Group in Sri Lanka from 2000 to 2006. And the founder president of the Childhood Respiratory Disease uh, Study Circle in Sri Lanka from 2007 to 2017. He was chairman of the Board of Study in Pediatrics of the PGIM University of Colombo from 2003 to 2006. He was honored with prestigious awards of the Outstanding Pediatrician of Asia by the Asia Pacific Pediatric Association in 2007. He was the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association in 2013 and the president of the Colombo Medical School Alumni Association 2015. He has over 70 oral presentations in Sri Lanka and abroad. He's the author of over 140 scientific publications in peer-reviewed journals, including journals listed in the Index Medicus. He has delivered 12 scientific orations and many guest lectures at national and international meetings. He has been editor, chapter, author, or joint author of 13 books, including his own bio autobiography, a trick known only to a few. And in a lighter vein, he's a well-known cricketer and a national ranked tennis player. Sir, I think uh, that is a, uh, I, I want to introduce him. Before introducing him, I want to mention that he, in his illustrious career, he has gone through several epidemics of measles. So he is person about uh, the measles, clinical features, and infections. What do you say? Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everyone can hear me and see my slides. Can we have some acknowledgement? At least one person to say that yes. uh, you can yes, hear sir. me. We can and, see the uh, we can, yes, hear. You can see the slides. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes or sir. raise your hand or something to that effect. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, can, you can hear. Sir, me. Yes, it's clear. All right. Uh, uh, thank you, President, sir, for those very kind words of introduction. Uh, some of it uh, thoroughly undeserved, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, I will try to do justice to all the things that uh, the President said about me. 
Now, measles, is it a, a thing of the past? But I'm sure out of the audience, uh, a vast majority would never have seen uh, 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 a case of measles. So that it will be true to say that it could be a thing in the past. Yes, I think it will be justifiable to say, yes, it was something in the past. Well, that is really only until this year. But not now, not quite, not by a long shot. Because measles became a thing of the past due to vaccination. And it is now raising its ugly head due to vaccine hesitancy. Now, if you, I think uh, President Sir mentioned about some personal experience that I have gone through. As a medical student in the late 1960s, way before many of you were born, and a junior medical uh, middle grade doctor in the 1970s, as well as a consultant in the 1980s, I saw loads and loads and loads of measles. Rubiola, mobili, that is, those are the other terms that are used for this disease called measles. It had a very high morbidity and quite significant mortality as well at that time. Measles is now seen actually mainly in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and a few countries in the West. It's endemic with outbreaks in some Asian and Afri African countries. In developing countries like Africa and Asia, it is due to a lack of vaccines and vaccine hesitancy both. Uh, however, in the developed countries in the West and the Middle East, it is purely due to vaccine hesitancy and not due to a lack of the vaccine. They have plenty of money, so they have the vaccines. Now, to tell you something about measles, it is an airborne, highly contagious uh, viral disease, belong the virus belonging to the paramyxovirus group. And about the infectivity, when I say contagious, now one example that is given in the internet is that if you take 10 non-immune contacts of a patient and the, the people, these 10 people stay with the patient for just one minute, nine will get measles. So you can, it just goes to show how severely contagious this viral diseases. It's a serious problem that can lead to complications and death. Now, here are the causes uh, of major problems with the disease. You can have keratitis and blindness, especially with vitamin, associated vitamin A deficiency. You can have severe diarrhea leading to dehydration, which can really kill. And we used to see a lot of these cases uh, who died due to dehydration because they were brought to hospital very late. Ear infections, well-known complication of uh, measles, can lead to deafness. And acute viral encephalitis, leading to brain damage. Major lower respiratory tract infections and pneumonia, leading to death. And subacute sclerosing fan encephalitis, it's a slow virus infection of the brain, where the incidence has been estimated to be somewhere around 6.5 to 11 per 100,000. It's quite rare but we'll talk about it in a little while. Now, if you look at some of the World Health Organization WHO data, between 2000 and 2021, vaccination averted 56 million measles deaths globally. However, in 2019, measles still caused 207,000 deaths in the world. So in spite of all this, all the efforts, that significant numbers of children especially, are dying of measles in uh, several countries as far as uh, the data from WHO goes. In 2022, 83% of children in the world received at least one dose of measles vaccine before their first birthday. So you would think 
that 83% coverage of all children in the world would be sufficient to prevent uh, an outbreak of measles, but it is not so. Because herd immunity is difficult to establish against measles simply because the virus itself is extremely contagious. And a very, very high level of population immunity with two doses in as close to 100% of the population as possible is required for significant protection. So that is a, a real big ask uh, for us to achieve that degree of immunity in a population. However, vaccine hesitancy, you add vaccine hesitancy to all these problems, it will scuttle this and kill the children. Now, if you look at the clinical features of measles, incubation period is 10 to 14 days, which is followed by high swinging fever, coryza, cough, and conjunctival diffusion with generalized signs of toxicity and feeling ill. Uh, these children, generally even from very early on in the disease, uh, one characteristic feature is that um, they, they look quite ill. The characteristic complex spots, I think many people would have at least heard of it, they appear by the second or third day. There are white spots on a red base in the buccal mucosa, like grains of salt, and especially around the upper molar areas, the buccal mucosa around the upper molar areas. It was described by Henry Coplick, a New York pediatrician, in, as far back as 1896. And then you get the characteristic erythematous maculopapula and confluent rash, which appears according to most authorities, by about the fourth day. Acute complications may develop from the fifth day onwards. <clears throat> now, this is a very typical uh, presentation of, uh, of the temperature and the other features superimposed on a graph. You can see that uh, I will try to get my... Uh, doesn't seem to give... Uh, okay, got it. There's a pointer. Right. You can see when it starts that how the temperature continues to go up, starting with somewhere around 99 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit and going by about the fourth of it day, around up, uh, up to about 104. I mean, this doesn't happen in all cases, but this is a very typical presentation. And you can see at the bottom that coryza, cough, and conjunctivitis start off virtually from the first day. Then the coplic spots appear somewhere around the second or third day. And of course, the rash classically appears around the fourth day. And the moment this rash appears, the temperature tends to settle down a little bit more, but still will take a couple of days for it to come down to normal. Now, even if you forget everything else that I say. These are the images of various um, pictures, images of uh, measles as they present. Um, this is important for you to see because most of you may not have seen measles. So you have the uh, this kind of uh, uh, thing which usually the, the rash starts off on the face and the neck and behind the ears and things like that. Then it spreads to the rest of the body. You get conjunctival suffusion here. And these are uh, the bottom two pictures on the right bottom corner are uh, the characteristic coptic spots. And you get this rash going on to the palms as well, palms and soles as well. And of course, here is a child, uh, uh, a kind of dark child, in whom sometimes it's a little bit difficult to spot the rash, but with, improve, uh, with involvement of the eyes as well. So you can see that the rash is there right over the face. Um, the acute killer complications of measles are diarrhea with intensive dehydration, if especially if not treated, acute encephalitis, and acute respiratory infections. Now, I told you that I will talk a little bit about subacute sclerosing panencephalitis or SSPE is the acronym. Uh, it's caused by a slow virus infection by measles, the virus staying dormant in humans for extended periods of time and then for reasons quite yet unknown, 
they get reactivated in the brain and the manifestations are seen 8 to 10 11 years after measles so it's a very long period after which only the problems start to show and visual symptoms sometimes recede by about you know two years which is a pretty long time and the classic lesion being focal necrotizing macular retinitis retinal hemorrhages papillary demand blindness which can all occur as the eye manifestation which precede the development or destruction of the brain. Uh, and then these are followed by progressive cognitive decline, initially personality or behavior changes, followed by poor school performance, intellectual deterioration. Uh, then there is steady deterioration in motor function, which goes hand in hand with the um, cognitive disturbances. You might get myoclonus, autonomic dysfunction, and focal paralysis. And some have either focal or generalized seizures as well. And now this is, I think, the most important part of it. The last two lines, patients eventually fall into a vegetative state or a kinetic mutism, which is shortly followed by death. And there is 95% mortality. And the literature says, uh, in about 5%, you get a spontaneous remission for no reason that we are aware of. Uh, we don't know who or uh, what type of patient will go into a, a, a remission. But most important thing, there is no treatment at the present time. So if you diagnose SSP, you are virtually signing the death certificate. Now, in 1963, the first live virus measles vaccine was licensed in the U United States of America. Now, measles was endemic in Sri Lanka up to late 1980s with heavy outbreaks on and off. Because once it is endemic, you can get outbreaks uh, for various reasons. So, measles vaccination was started in August 94, uh, 84. And uh, here are two uh, research uh, papers that uh, we looked at that uh, virtually one year after the vaccination was started, I was working in Ratnapura and there was a lot of measles in Ratnapura. We looked at the impact of the accelerated immunization program in Ratnapura after the introduction of the measles vaccine. And there was a tremendous reduction in the uh, admission of cases uh, with measles to the wards. But however, later on, even in 1991, that is uh, kind of seven years after the, 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 the vaccine was introduced, that we still found cases and it was still the cause for childhood morbidity. This was because vaccination was slow to catch on from 1984 to 1990 or so. Now, there were major outbreaks with many deaths in 1999 and 2000, as well as in 2013. Now, this 2013 one is quite significant. That is when the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine uh, was introduced and the powers that be decided uh, that's from the Ministry of Health, basically without consult a proper consultation with uh, the clinicians, the first dose to be given at one year rather than nine months. Uh, that was in 2011. And then we had a major epidemic around 2012 and 2013. And we made such a fuss, especially through the journal where I wrote two um, editorials on this. They, we forced them to revert back to the first dose at nine months in 2015. Now, Sri Lanka was declared measles free by the World Health Organization in 2019, that is four years ago. But then, currently, we have a resurgence of measles in 2023. The current measles outbreak in Sri Lanka, there are, uh, it's almost uh, always due to entirely, due entirely, really, to vaccine hesitancy that people have just not bothered to give the vaccine to the children. And there are some subtle differences because this is the type of thing that you get 
when you have outbreaks like this, um, where, where the disease has been under control for quite some time, uh, there were quite a number of under one year olds, I think, as uh, the president mentioned at the start. Uh, and there are variable heights of fever. So you won't get always the sort of very high fever that you get. Rash could come on earlier in some cases, around the third day, or much later, in seven to eight days, especially in those immunocompromised people. And just a few got it after natural measles, even those. Uh, people who have had natural measles before, that is the uh, kind of elderly component of the population, and they are mostly adults, or uh, after one vaccine dose, because one vaccine dose does not give you 100% protection. The complications are about the same. We are still going to see the same uh, types of complications, and only some have post-measles staining uh, because uh, post measles staining is a characteristic feature of measles as a disease earlier on, but uh, not all of them seem to get it this time. Uh, quite a few adults are affected, which is quite unusual uh, because it was thought to be a disease of children uh, for a very long time. None of the affected children have had two doses of the vaccine. The vast majority have not had any doses of the vaccine. So this is the important thing. This is why I kept on saying that it is due almost entirely to vaccine hesitancy. Now, in infants under 12 months are an important uh, component of the population in whom we have to really worry. Uh, it is the age group in whom most of the complications occur. And when you look at subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, where we said it's uh, something like 6.5 to 11 per 100,000, that is roughly about 1 per 10,000. Now here, when they get it in the first year of life, the risk is something like 1 in 5,500. That is, the risk is uh, doubled uh, from uh, the other age group. And they are quite susceptible due to the very low and undetectable body levels after six months of age. And this is particularly important because the transfer of antibodies through the placenta is the way in which the babies in the first year of life get some protection against the disease. And that obviously depends on mother's immunity. Now, mother's immunity and the amount of uh, of amount of antibodies that are there in the mother, which can be transmitted through the placenta, will depend to a certain extent on whether the mother has had natural infection or the mother's uh, immunity is due to vaccination. Now, all the mothers, almost all the mothers, they uh, have got, except very few perhaps, have got the immune status due to vaccination. And there's pretty good evidence now that the degree of immunity that they get following vaccination and therefore the transfer of that immunity to the baby is uh, less than what you get after natural disease. And that means, and there are, uh, there are pretty good uh, studies to prove this, that they have looked at the antibodies in the babies of mothers who have been vaccinated and they have found that the, the levels of antibodies by six months is virtually not there. And that makes them that much more susceptible to catch the disease. Now, the decision to give the first dose at nine months long ago was based on the presumption of the transfer of maternal antibodies because the maternal antibodies may have, because it's a live attenuated virus, that it could have knocked off the virus before immunity could be uh, stimulated. So that was the reason for giving it at nine months. But I think this position might need to change because uh, the immunity from six to nine months is practically non-existent in these babies. And now in some countries, the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, Wella vaccine is given at six months. A few countries in the West, uh, especially when the baby is due to travel to areas with a high prevalence of measles. And Canada is one country that practices this policy. Now, there are a couple of unusual cases that I would like to draw your attention to. Uh, 
The first one is a late middle-aged male who has had measles infection as a child. Um, and when I say late middle-aged, he's well over 50. Uh, so therefore, with that measles infection, you would expect lifelong immunity. The trouble is now he has multiple myeloma and he's being treated with immunosuppressive drugs. He got measles around the 18th of August, 2023, not very long ago, and was quite ill with a very severe attack. And he, in fact, developed some respiratory complications. He had exertional dyspnea with oxygen desaturation, with exertion. And the uh, computerized tomogram scan showed cellular bronchiolitis, which is one type of bronchiolitis that we can get. There are follicular bronchiolitis. They are, these are radiological identification of the changes that one sees on a CT scan. He has fortunately recovered well with intensive treatment, needed uh, loads of very powerful antibiotics. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm pleased to report that uh, the patient is, uh, is recovering very well. The second one is an adult lady doctor who has had two doses of vaccine as a child and got measles around the latter part of August 2023. Recovered well. He is quite healthy before and not on any immunosuppressant. Now, this particular person, I have treated as a child, and I have given the vaccine, uh, the first dose of pure measles vaccine, uh, around eight and a half months of age. Hmm. And uh, then later on, somebody has given the MMR uh, when she was about eight years of age. So I don't know whether this sort of time gap would have had something to do with it. But it was good to see uh, the immunization card with my writing and with very well-known uh, red pen uh, that is there. Incidentally, uh, there is nothing against our using red uh, in our notes. So there are several possibilities. One is whether one of those vaccines was ineffective or whether for some reason she had waning of the immunity or she had come across an extra virulent virus which could have overridden her, uh, her immunity in her body. But anyway, she also has recovered. Uh, so, all is well, that ends well. A couple of random musings on uh, on, on measles, uh, not uh, totally related to the current situation, but I think it's good information for you to know. We know, and there are pretty good reports of uh, acute attacks of measles that are known to induce long-term remissions in idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. And this is possibly due to the, uh, the immunomodifying uh, actions of measles. Because we know even the drugs that modify immunity uh, have a place in the treatment of nephrotic syndrome. So measles does that. It, in addition, has impact on the immune status of the body. And that is probably one of the reasons uh, why you get uh, violent uh, infections in measles secondary bacterial infections, and which kills. Then measles virus vaccine strain infection, infection by the measles virus vaccine of Edmonton Zagreb uh, uh, variant, uh, and measles vaccine itself have shown some effect in very aggressive Burkitt lymphoma. There are, there is, there are some reports where uh, these uh, Burkitt lymphoma cases, which did not respond, uh, have responded to this. Last one is the extra potent measles vaccine is being tested as a treatment for multiple myeloma. Significant success has been reported by the Mayo Clinic. And uh, we could hope that the patient that I mentioned, the first one, the unusual case, who already has multiple myeloma, by getting needles, it might change the clinical picture for that person, perhaps for the better. Finally, a parting shot, ladies and gentlemen. I personally have every reason 
to have a certain amount of brain damage. One was because my birth weight was around 800 grams and hardly anybody survived at that time. Uh, when you look at my age, uh, who were under, under two kilograms really. Uh, and then I have also, to make matters worse, I have also had measles and keflopathy where I was either semi-conscious or unconscious for about three or four weeks at age around five years. So there's every reason to believe that there has been considerable amount of brain damage as far as I'm personally con uh, concerned. But that is perhaps the other reason why I am so passionate about this, this disease of uh, measles. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to take my leave now. And as this beautiful young lady would say, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, sir, for that really enlightening presentation and sharing your uh, wealth of your information with all of us. And I'm happy to say there's a large audience to listen to your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Janaki Abhinayagar. She's a consultant medical virologist, and she's the head of department of virology in Medical Research Institute, Colombo. And she's the lead in measles uh, uh, in MRI and I was very happy when she agreed to uh, uh, join our webinar. Dr. Abhinayaka pursued her higher education in medical virology and was awarded a scholarship to the prestigious Stanford University, United States of America after completing her doctoral uh, qualification in medical virology at PGIM University of Colombo. She was a leading she uh, had a leading role in initial COVID-19 battle in the country and in recognition of her outstanding dedication and exemplary performance of duties in public service, she received the Rotary Award for Vocational Excellence in year 2020. She was also presented with research awards for her exceptional scientific research at Sri Lanka President's Award and from SLMA and PGIM. Um, Honored and privileged to invite Dr. Ajanaki Abhinayaka, consultant medical virologist, head of department of virology, MRI, Colombo. Thank you, President, sir. So I will share my slides. Um... Can you see my slides? Not yet. Can't see the slides. Not yet. Uh, Dr. Janaki, we can't see your slides.
you can see the slides. Hello. Yeah, Janaki, we, are, we can hear you now. Okay, right. So, okay, good afternoon, everyone. So, in the next uh, 30 minutes, I'll be talking on measles country situation and the laboratory diagnosis of measles. And then this is the outline of my today's talk. So, measles virus infection and little bit of virology. And then the measles vaccine milestone and the impact of uh, the vaccine for the disease. And then the global measles trends and 2023 Sri Lanka outbreak. And also, then later, uh, laboratory diagnosis of measles infection and also finally challenges for global measles crisis. Okay, so uh, I think this is a little bit overlapping, but, uh, but still I'm going. So measles is highly infectious. It is, it is vaccine preventable disease and transmission through respiratory droplets and aerosol. That means actually coughing, sneezing, and direct contact with secretions can spread the disease. So incubation period is 10 to 14 days. And it is infectious before and after four days of symptoms onset. And then the clinical spectrum vary from mild febrile rash, severe pneumonia, and even to encephalitis and even to death. So... Um, So milestones of the uh, global measles infection and the measles vaccine. So in 1954, Dr. Thomas and Enders were able to isolate the measles virus from a 13-year-old David Edmonston blood. In 1963, Enders used the Edmonston B strain to develop a measles vaccine, which was licensed in the United States in 1963. In 1971, measles was combined with mumps and rubella and as a trivalent MMR vaccine was licensed in USA in 1971. So in Sri Lanka, measles uh, vaccine was introduced in 1984 to the children of nine months old age. And then the measles rubella, that means a uh, MMR vaccine was introduced again in 2001 for the children of three years. Then later on, actually MMR, measles mumps rubella vaccine was introduced in 2011 for the age group of nine months and also for three years. So very briefly about the uh, virology, while measles virus is divided into eight clades containing 24 genotypes and all vaccine strains are included in genotype phase. So you can see uh, A to H uh, we have uh, clades. So uh, again, little bit of genotypes also. Since 1990, there were 19 genotypes were identified in the world, but actually you can see in this table with time, so uh, all the most of the genotypes have disappeared and when it comes to 2016, 17, 18, only few um, genotypes are um, circulating in the world. So namely B3, D4, D5, D8, D9 and H1, they are circulating in, in the latter part of the 2016, 17 and 18. So this is again the global map. So same genotypes are circulating, B3, D4, D8, H1 across the globe. So this is uh, this table actually gives the uh, Southeast Asia region uh, genotypes at that during that period. That means actually 2008 to 2018. So again, B3, D4, D8, D9, and H1. So those are the genotypes actually circulating in the world at that period. So we can appreciate in the Sri Lanka. So in 2016, 16, 17, and 18. So it was identified in B3 in 2016, 17, D8, and 2018. It was H1 genotype, measles genotype was circulated. So actually, this is a very good fact uh, just, to, just to understand. Actually, we didn't have at this, this period that much of endemic circulation uh, because actually in different years, we identified different genotypes. So coming to the measles elimination goals in six WHO regions. So in uh, 2012, the World Health Assembly set goals to measles elimination by 2015 and 2020 in the WHO region. So, so uh, European region actually they had their goals for uh, eliminate the measles by 2015 and Southeast Asia region you can see actually they have set the goals for eliminate the measles by 2020. But actually you can't, we can't achieve this 
goals and in the Southeast Asia region, so re uh, goals were set for eliminate the measles by 2023. Still, actually, we couldn't achieve that. So in globally, measles elimination verified in several countries. So region of America, they verified the measles elimination in September 2016. And Europe, European region actually, out of 53 countries, 37 countries actually, uh, they eliminated measles. And then the Eastern Mediterranean region, again, four countries, they have uh, verified. And in the Southeast Asian region, so they have, uh, we have actually five countries eliminated measles, including Sri Lanka. And in the Western Pacific region also, we have eight countries that has verified as measles eliminated. So what happened later? So in this uh, 2018 data, so it very clearly shows in the region of America, even though they actually declared measles verification uh, eliminated in uh, 2000. So we can see actually uh, suspected cases as well as the laboratory confirmed cases reported uh, more than 16,000. So that means they have uh, time crime outbreaks uh, in the American region. So what is the uh, Sri Lanka situation in 2017 and 2018? This is just before the measles elimination in Sri Lanka. So in 2017, so we actually tested 229 samples. So with actually IgM marker and also the PCR. So five cases became positive and out of that actually, we confirmed with the PCR and then the, we did the sequencing. So we actually identified that that is as a genotype D8. That is in 2017. When it comes to the 2018, again, we tested 143 samples. So out of that, actually, again, we uh, found eight positive cases from actually IgM and also the PCR. So only two cases actually we identified as the uh, from the PCR. So here again, we did sequencing and the, then we identified it is another genotype that is genotype H1 in 2018. So in 2019, unfortunately, we experienced this, this uh, measles outbreak that is in March 2019. That was actually started in March 2019. So during that period, uh, we uh, tested 266 samples and out of that actually, we found 52 cases, positive cases, 52. So all actually we tested from uh, IgM. So that means blood IgM and also the PCR with the PCR. So total positive cases anyway, 52. So we uh, again then uh, we did the genotyping and then uh, sequencing. So sequencing, we understand actually all the cases actually uh, from a one link, one link. So and then it was actually the measles genotype D8. So a little bit of history here. So what happened here? So the first um, case was a, as a, actually a medical student. So what happened? There was a priest who was treated at NHS National Hospital of Sri Lanka. So this medical student take care of this priest and this priest was visited to USA. And then once we actually uh, do the sequencing and then we blast with the gene bank sequence, we identified this actually link is very much related to the this uh, New York, uh, USA strain. So that means actually the clinical, his, uh, our history as well as our investigations very much uh, tally. And then we, we noted that this was an imported case. So because of that actually, uh, uh, because this is actually very much uh, closer to the getting the elimination certificate. So in 2019 and then because, and then we uh, confirm this as an imported one, and then we actually could get the elimination certificate also. And at the same time, actually, we control this outbreak very uh, in a shorter period. So for the interest, actually, we published this data in the Journal of Clinical Virology in 2020. So moving on to the current measles situation. So measles outbreaks are occurring in every region of the world. And uh, in this table, actually, uh, we can see the top 10 countries with global measles reported to WHO Geneva. That is actually in this table, uh, we can see the list is topped by the India with a case number of more than 57,000. So this uh, data is actually for the period of uh, January 2023 to June 2023. 
So not only those countries actually, uh, the, this measles outbreak and the cases are actually reported even in the USA. So USA in 2019, they had a huge number of uh, cases and then uh, dramatically these cases actually reduced in 2020, 21, 2022. And then when it comes to the 2023, they have only still um, 19 cases reported. Same in the uh, European region. So we have actually uh, experienced that um, measles outbreak. So in different countries, including United Kingdom. So they have reported 56 cases for the period of February 2022, January 2023. So this slide I brought actually just to show. Now I was telling there were a lot of genotypes. Now you can see actually only two genotypes are circulating for the period of 2022, 2023. So those are B3 and D8. Uh, so that means actually other um, genotypes have disappeared from the world and then uh, other thing actually in when coming into the 2023 it is again the majority of the genotype circulating is the DA. So coming to the regional situation, so I was telling in the region, five countries we actually uh, verified uh, as the measles eliminated. So Bhutan, DPR, Korea, Maldives, Sri Lanka and Timor Leste. So what happened here again, unfortunately, in 2022, Bhutan has actually reported few cases. And then again, Timor Leste, they have reported few cases. But actually, DPR Korea, Maldives, and Sri Lanka, we don't have any cases for the 2022. When it comes to the 2023, again, so Bhutan actually still they have some cases. And DPR Korea, they didn't have any cases. Maldives, they reported cases, unfortunately. And Sri Lanka, they we have quite a lot of numbers, so that is very unfortunate. And then Timor Leste, they have uh, controlled their um, cases and they don't have reported any cases for still for 2023. So this is the regional situation. Uh, okay, so coming to the Sri Lanka measles laboratory testing data in 2022. So uh, we tested actually 81 samples for the whole year. So this is actually basically uh, IgM we tested after that actually uh, because actually we don't get that much of sub samples that is why we have to go only with the IgM samples and then uh, once we have positives we actually get the sub samples also one sub sample actually we uh, got positive for PCR also then later on we did the sequencing and what happened here was so this is the phylogenetic tree later on sequencing analysis. So you can see this case was after analyzing it, it, it is sitting very much closer to this vaccine type. Vaccine type, it is a uh, genotype A, Edmundston strain. So then when we go to the history of this uh, case, so it was a child uh, with 10 months old and who has taken the MMR vaccination and then reported with the fever and rash after 10 days of vaccination. So this is actually very much uh, similar to this uh, uh, vaccine uh, type. So this is actually then um, finalized as the uh, as a vaccine case. So that is the only case we reported in 2022 uh, from the PCR. So then um, current measles situations in the country. So in 2023, so uh, from January to May, we reported, uh, we actually tested 40 cases. So out of that, actually two were positive with the IgM. So in February case, we couldn't get any uh, sub samples. So because of that, we couldn't do for PCR testing and uh, any genotyping. But fortunately, this uh, case from the May, so we could uh, get down the sub sample. So with that, we did the PCR and it became positive. And what we did was we did the sequencing. So then the sequencing also actually, um, it, it came as the measles genotype D8. So this is the first case actually uh, after the elimination of Sri Lanka. So we reported this as the uh, first case. So this case is uh, age 23, uh, 23 year old male. Actually, case was uh, we received from the National Hospital and then later on, actually, we understand. So this is from an area of some Mardan, but actually, uh, we didn't know that much because we don't get that much with the request. So hereafter, that means up to the May, that is the uh, situation. Then from June, July, August, you can see in this uh, 
uh, we have an increasing trend. So total number 43 for June and then the July we, we, we received cases uh, 205 and then the August until 21st we received 258 cases. So out of that actually you can see with IGM only here you can see again the increasing trend of positivity. 12 for June and then the July 78 and then the August up to now up to 21st we had 84 positives IgM cases so all together for three months uh, out of 506 total tested samples we uh, had 174 positive cases so this is actually underestimating because these samples actually we don't get in the proper timing they, they don't collect in the proper with the proper timing that means actually very day one sometimes actually blood samples are coming so because of that actually they are negative so i will tell that so then we received as some not from all the cases we don't get uh, sub samples so we received 235 sub samples so we tested out of that actually we uh, we were it was positive 187 cases were positive so then we analyzed actually how much actually uh, positive only for pcr so we noted that um, here 89 cases were positive only with the PCR. So here that is why I was telling this, this figure is this 174 is kind of a, uh, underestimating because uh, we didn't collect the sample at the proper time. So that is uh, uh, we have to be actually alert uh, when we are taking the samples. Anyway, now uh, so out of these PCR positives right up to July we did genotyping. Up to July we did genotyping. So 42 cases we did genotyping. So uh, genotyping and then the sequencing. Uh, so what is the results here? So then this is the phylogenetic tree after doing the phylogenetic analysis. So all 42 cases became as the D8 genotype. G D8 measures genotype. So then again what we did was uh, we actually see these sequences are blast with the GenBank sequences and that is actually just to see the link of this uh, cases. So then we identified two links here. One is actually Victoria, Australia, and then the other link is Ahmabad, India. So out of the 42 cases, out of the 42 cases, 40 cases at the link of Australia, and only two cases actually we had the uh, link to the Indian uh, origin. So then uh, that is the uh, outbreak situation. So because of that, so now in the outbreak situation, the global resource, so this outbreak is actually not on Sri Lanka, so it is globally. So because of that, actually, resources are very limited. So uh, we actually uh, determine not to uh, go for another genotyping if there is a special cases arise. So and actually, it is not my decision or country decision. This is a regional decision. So we actually stop genotyping. Uh, we didn't do after July. So then here, I just wanted to tell. So total blood samples we received 518. So out of that, uh, 175 cases we identified uh, from May uh, 2023 to 21st August. And then all together actually positive cases, positive cases. So we had 264 because uh, on 89 cases actually we didn't have IgM positivity. So this is the situation of the uh, now current outbreak. So one more thing here. So uh, now... Um, Actually, uh, now we experience, so all the provinces have the cases. So uh, that is also a good thing just to stop the genotyping. Otherwise, actually, if we are getting some different geography, we have to do the genotyping also. Now we know all the um, provinces are uh, having cases and also the it is uh, genotype D. So then we analyze. more than 20 years age group. So more than 20 years age group. And then the second group is the uh, age three years to 10 years age group. That is uh, the second group that uh, this uh, our cases are belong. And also we identified actually there are cases uh, belong nine months age also. So this is the age. Uh, breakdown and then the vaccination history actually we didn't get so because of that actually I can't comment here whether these all the people had vaccine uh, vaccination or 
one vaccine or what. But anyway, actually, which I understood was actually majority they didn't uh, get the vaccine or some actually they have only uh, got the one dose. So then um, with that actually uh, current uh, sit uh, situation, so I'm moving on to the measles laboratory diagnosis. So here um, we can have test methodologies, four test methodologies we can have. But um, here we are using for the outbreak investigations only two methodologies. One actually a detection of measles viral RNA by a real-time PCR. And then the second one is actually detection of measles virus specific IgM with the ELISA assay. So four-fold increase in measles IgG in acute and yeah. cell And also isolation of measles virus in cell culture also we can perform, but actually in outbreak investigations, we don't go for those. And then the viral markers actually, and timing of testing is very important. So you can see here, in, uh, if we are going for a PCR, and then PCR and detecting RNA, we have to collect the early sample. So if you are actually targeting IgM antibodies and go for ELISA testing, serology, so you have to take the little later sample. So PCR, uh, you can see RNA, viremia is disappearing when the immune response is building up. So because of that, only actually early samples, we can go for PCR and then the not very early samples, we can go for the IgM. So what are the specimens that we can collect? Uh, one specimen is the serum blood sample, and then the other specimen is the throat nasal swab or nasopharyngeal swab. So this is very, we have to very clear about this. So serum sample, if we are test collecting for serology, we have to collect it the 5 to 28 after onset of rash. And then if you are sele selecting, go for a PCR testing, that is RNA detection, you have to take the sample very early phase, that is first five days of illness after uh, appearing the rash. So it is the sample is actually nasopharyngeal swab or throat or nasal swab. So we have to be very cautious when you are uh, when we are selecting these samples uh, for testing. Uh, so I think uh, being the eliminated country, so we have to go for parallel testing. That is what the WHO recommending. But in the outbreak situation, we can't do that. Parallel testing in the sense, from each sample, we have to go for measles IgM and rubella IgM. So that is what they recommend. But here in the outbreak, we know now it is measles everywhere. So only measles negative cases, we are going for rubella. But actually, otherwise, we are going with the rubella IgM as a first test. So this I was actually describing. Mm. And little bit of actually in the laboratory situation. So laboratory actually uh, in the elimination uh, status, uh, elimination uh, situation. So we have to have an accredited laboratory to test the measles sample. So how we are managing our accreditation status. So we have to participate for the proficiency testing panels. That is EQA panels which are distributed from the WHO. And also, so confirmatory testing, that means actually we have to send our samples also to the regional reference laboratories just to see our quality. And then at the same time, there was a WHO expert team for accreditation visits to uh, inspect our laboratories and also they, they observe the process. So with that, they are recommending, okay, this laboratory is accredited and then we can perform the measles testing. So that is how actually we are maintaining the laboratory status also as an accredited laboratory. So I would like to add here, so country has a strong surveillance system as a partners of global measles rubella elimination program. So for this surveillance actually, that is why actually we catch this first case also, right? So this uh, strong surveillance, uh, so what is the basic definition is? We, uh, so e e each case actually, if somebody noticed in the patient present to the hospital or from the uh, MOI, if they identify the case with a fever rash, so they have to take the samples and send it to the uh, medical, research in medical research institute for testing of measles. So then only actually we can catch the um, cases. So otherwise uh, we can't catch the cases. So that is why I was telling it is a strong surveillance in Sri Lanka. So then actually this is the measles rubella testing algorithm. This is actually shared by the um, WHO. So we have to, in the routine testing, we have to uh, follow this one. But during, again, I'm telling in the outbreak situation, we can't follow this because a lot of testing we have to do. Uh, 
but here we don't do in the outbreak situation. So finally, actually, what are the challenges for global measles uh, crisis now? So it could be a uh, vaccine, uh, vaccine, uh, vaccine may be the challenge, and then also the gaps in surveillance. So vaccine challenges may be actually primary vaccine failure, secondary vaccine failure, and also actually zero conversion rates are around sometimes it is 97%. Uh, so anyway, so we don't do a uh, post testing after vaccination, we don't actually confirm the uh, what is, uh, whether this person is protective or not. So protective level is 120 milli international units per ml. So we don't do this testing. So because of that, actually we don't know whether it is zero converted or uh, zero con zero converted or not of this that particular individual who has taken the vaccine. So th those are the challenges. And then again, uh, gaps in surveillance also are a challenge. So number one as the incorrect vaccination coverage data, either high or low. So that will be a problem. And then the under underestimate of the actual number of cases, that is also a challenge. And also inefficient management of human and financial resources. And finally, poor laboratory capacity also a challenge uh, for this uh, crisis. So Apart from that, actually, so we do have laboratory challenges also. Sample could be a challenge, as I mentioned, and also testing methodologies and also interpretation also be a challenge. So sample, if it is not properly collected uh, and if it is not the uh, time, if, uh, proper, proper type of the sample, so then again, it is a challenge. So we can't actually go for proper testing. And even in the testing methodologies, we have a lot of uh, challenges like actually intercurrence. Uh, of the test kits and also uh, when we are doing the testing some equipment failures and also control failure those are challenges so anyway so we can actually minimize uh, we minimize our uh, laboratory challenges if the uh, proper sample is uh, coming in specially so for that actually we have this guideline um, so this is actually circulated uh, through a ministry circular so i think if somebody is actually sending a sample at least once uh, you, if you go through this guideline and then according to that, if you select the sample and if you in fact can send the sample, I think laboratory challenges will be minimized and we can actually provide the accurate report in a very short um, um, duration of time. So I think uh, that is the message I have to tell because actually we being the laboratory people, so we are sometimes helpless when we get a um, poor quality sample. So that means actually garbage in, garbage out. So we don't want to do that. So because of that, I'm actually requesting anybody who wants to send a sample, please go through this uh, guide actually. So I think uh, with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, Thank you very much, uh, Janaki, for that really enlightening uh, presentation. And it's uh, very alarming to note the situation of measles in our country, I think you gave the correct picture. Uh, and if you have any questions to our to esteemed speakers, uh, you can ask any questions that are burning. There are a few questions. Yeah, yeah there is one. So there's one question. How long would we have to wait for MMR vaccination after measles? Infection if the patient is not already vaccinated. Uh, Janaki, you have to answer that. How long do we have to wait for MMR vaccination after measles infection if the patient is not already vaccinated? Okay, so it is uh, like this. So if the patient is already having the measles infection, so it is a natural infection, right? So actually, we don't recommend for uh, again vaccination. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another question. If a child has suffered from measles following the first MMR vaccination, is the second booster indicated? So when should it be given? Geet Anjali. Geet So can I answer yes, for the question? Yeah, uh, question yes. is actually first, first vaccination is vaccination. having some Measles yeah, if, type infection, right? Yeah, if a child has suffered from measles, following the first MMR vaccine. That is the vaccine in view. Yeah, yeah it's uh, actually, uh, it's yeah, entirely, you have to ask that question clearly. It's definitely. 
Yeah, I think Jaya Tilak. Anyway, what she means is, I think if a child has suffered from measles following the first MMR vaccination, is the second booster indicated? If so, when should it be given? Yeah, so the answer would be actually, yes, the second uh, second booster is you have to give because actually this is most of the time, like side effects, you can have that mild rash, right? Not full-blown one, mild rash you can have. So because of that, actually, you can't avoid, rather than any special allergies or anything, so you can't actually avoid from the second uh, boost, I think. So that is what I, I would recommend. You have to go for If it is not a severe allergy, because this is a, uh, because we experience, as I mentioned in my PowerPoint presentation also, we experienced several cases like that because not all the cases actually we found, but actually there are cases who experience. So that is uh, after the vaccination and then second dose is actually recommended. Not You can't escape from that. There's another question. I think that is El Fernando is probably Lakuma, is it? If an adult example over 60 years of age has not got vaccinated, and no history of measles in the past should we vaccinate them, madam? Yes, there are no because there are no contraindications. I think you can, right? Yeah. Right. There's another question. Most of the population are vaccinated through EPI program. Then why we are worried about regarding the few people who are hesitant to vaccinate? That is actually a difficult question because now uh, herd immunity, we are talking about the herd immunity also, right? right? So in that case, with the data, uh, only we have to analyze because we don't know. Because e according to the EPI, we are telling, okay, more than 95% is uh, covered. But actually now we can see uh, in our with our data, so a lot of actually uh, children, children are affecting with the infection. So with that actually, we don't know about... Uh, whether this is this is adequate for generate herd immunity, you know, the coverage. But we are telling, okay, more than 95%, 98%, but we are not sure whether this is adequate to generate. If it, if it is adequate for generate herd immunity, so in that case, we don't want to worry. But still, I don't think. Uh, you want to... Yeah, there, there, there is probably another reason as well. Uh, because this will be uh, uh, a pocket of people who have not been or who are uh, hesitant to give the vaccine who are at risk. And if they get measles, what my personal worry is that they can spread it to the under uh, nine month old babies. They are at grave risk actually of this, uh, this uh, particular age group. So that is why really we have to make sure that uh, vaccine hesitancy is uh, reduced to, you know, really as much as possible. The ideal would be not to have or zero uh, vaccine hesitancy, simply because that if they get it, if some of those people or even the bigger children who are hesitant, uh, they are not being given the vaccine, that the chances of them spreading it to the uh, uh, the infants under nine months who are more prone to develop the complications becomes a real problem. So that is why we have to worry about those who are hesitant to give the vaccine. Yeah, there's another question. Uh, from uh, I want to ask you. Yes. Uh, there are a lot of pediatricians in the private sector who would want to do the serology testing. And uh, uh, what is your advice to them? Can they get it done at MRI because it's not available freely? Dr. Kosal, of course, yes. So this is actually, we we actually uh, recommended uh, just to send, this is and again, it is free of charge. I think uh, one actually advisory committee, we actually uh, minuted that. So all the private sector, whoever wants, so they are, they are suspecting even GPs, they can send the sample. So and then again, it is free of charge we are doing. And here again, so we are actually generating a report within three days because we are answerable to the global program. 
So because of that, reports are ready. The people who are sending the sample, so it is their duty to collect the sample uh, report within at least five days. Come and walk to the MRI and collect the report. So we don't wait even after uh, four days because we are bonded to the global program. So we don't delay any. So and then anybody can send the sample. It is free of charge. This decision was taken by the Director General Health Service in the advisory committee. So the reports are ready within um, four days. I think uh, that's a very important message because people are reluctant to uh, send the samples, thinking, I mean, uh, yeah, it will overload your capacities and uh, they are worried about it. Uh, Janaki, can I, uh, is BJC, can I ask something? Because yes, things sir. seem to be in short supply in very many places in the in the ministry. Uh, how are you for funding for reagents and things like that? Because I'm sure they are going to be quite expensive, your uh, test uh, kits and all the reagents that you need. How are you for funding at the moment? Yes, sir. It is like this. So that now we are getting all the reagents from the CDC, uh, Atlanta, USA. Uh, for routine testing and now I am maintaining with that and because of the outbreak Sri Lanka they specially consider us and they send another batch of batch actually that means actually larger batch but that day can you remember sir I was asking from the DGHS just to get a local purchase also so he agreed and I put it to the local purchase uh, track also sometimes I can get that also but actually here again I am mainly focusing for the IgM IgM arm that is why I am telling if somebody is selling Telling, uh, taking the sample, please take after day three or day five of the patient develop a rash. Otherwise, I am wasting my reagent serology. But if there is a, uh, now we know, now we know the geography and everything and the genotype, everything. So because of that, we don't want to go for that much of sequencing. If there is a special case, immunosuppress or whatever. So then in that case, we can take a sub also at the same time and then we can go for a um, sequencing. Anyway, in the immunocompromised population, sometimes antibody must be not there. So because of that, you can send a swab. But otherwise, so you can send a blood sample, properly collected timing, especially timing. Otherwise, I am wasting my um, reagents. Uh, there's another question from Dr. Sashi Haran. Uh, 1994 born ch ch child's got MR according to EPI. Should they need to get uh, MMR second dose? Um, this is 1994. Uh, do they include both vaccines? So if they included both vaccines, two doses, so then it is not necessary. So if they don't include it, so they can take the second booster also. Yeah, I think that is the age group that uh, got uh, only one vaccine, isn't it? 94, yeah. 97, I think. Yeah, okay. So in that case, they can take the second booster. So that was done actually in 2019 when there was an outbreak. Yes, maybe this is the medical students group. So that time they, they, are, they were around 24 years. So I think, yes. Yeah. So in that case, that time uh, we gave the second booster for them. So if there is anybody again, they don't ha have the second booster, they can go for MMR, no problem, as the bo booster dose, as the second dose. Uh, Dr. Kushla Adhijayatri said, any plan to vaccinate healthcare workers and other population? Uh, actually, um, I think uh, you were there that day, right? Advisory committee in the... Ministry, I don't think that they have still their plan because actually a uh, number of additional doses they were talking about limited. I'm not sure about that actually. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, and there's a comment by Dr. Lakuma Fernando. It say, he says that it needs 100% coverage, not 80, 95%. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I think, uh, Janaki, the message you gave, the, 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 the serology samples should be taken at least, uh, I mean, after the rash, uh, five, uh, three, few days later, isn't it? So yeah. that message should go across because a lot of, otherwise we'll have a lot of negatives uh, coming in. Uh, yeah. So in that case, Dr. Kosala, so we can't even close this outbreak. So if you send all the blood samples day one and then 
if no uh, other sub samples so we can close the outbreak so something like that so it yes. is very bad so that is why i'm stressing this i'm stressing this that is why when i analyze my sub samples and the blood samples so 89 samples actually only pcr was positive so that was uh, that that is actually not good for us in, even in the community so that is why i'm telling and can you remember that day dg was telling okay go ahead and do another circular ministry circular so i actually sent to the relevant authorities just to make the circular i'm not sure whether it is happening or not so anybody if can take the lead so it is good so this is the actually guide that i want to share with everybody right so that, that is very interesting uh, i think both the speakers were very informative any other questions anybody has burning any burning questions Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Kushtani again. Yeah, we uh, as a microbiologist uh, from hospitals, we have this problem of isolating these patients and managing them in hospitals. Uh, so uh, that is why I asked, like, I mean, we have some healthcare workers uh, who are not sure, like, uh, whether they are immune or not. Uh, they are not sure about the vaccination status and so on. Uh, so any uh, plans and that is why I, it's important. So uh, isolation facilities are limited in hospitals, I think. That may be, uh, that is a problem that we all have to think about. Uh, so are we to send them all to IDH or any plan, any suggestions? Thank you. Dr. Kosala, you can answer for that question. <laughs> uh, uh, at the moment in our hospitals, now if you if you take Lady Ridgeway Hospital, we are having we are also having the same problem. We have one isolation section, we are isolating there, and inside wards we have rooms to isolate. So there is no like proper plan. I think uh, uh, now I uh, since there's an outbreak, I don't think the, it has gone into the medical community as well. Uh, people are not very well aware that it's an outbreak. I think we should go and uh, inform the ministry to inform that this is an outbreak and take necessary actions. And as you said, uh, uh, the uh, IDH hospital would be the ideal place to isolate cases. And at the same time, I want to give a small message. Uh, do not uh, refer cases to DC clinics. Now, now, there is a tendency, now if you see a rash, with fever to refer to a dermatologist to diagnose it. Then you're exposing all other children as well. I mean, it's a clinical diagnosis as the, Dr. Vijay Sikhar with his very informative presentation. It's a purely a clinical diagnosis. I think, sir, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yes, I think there is uh, there is a comment about uh, what I said about SSP, uh, the high incidence when infected less than one year, uh, there will be an outbreak of SSP in 10 years time. Uh, I don't know whether we can really say that for sure, because the development of SSP depends on a lot of uh, factors. Uh, so, although the the figure of uh, the risk of developing SSP in infants is 1 in 5,500. It may not be a, a completely true figure, but we can probably expect a rise in cases in case there are lots of children who have uh, uh, lots of infants uh, who are diagnosed with uh, with uh, measles. So there is a, a risk of it increasing, but I don't know whether there will be all that many cases. It's very difficult to say. Uh, any other questions? Excuse me. I am uh, Emoj from uh, Jaffna region. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this uh, question is uh, for MRI, the virologist from uh, virologist. I want to expect answer because uh, in the field level, when we come across fever with rash children, we are 
as children or other people, we are sending for the hospital for sampling uh, to send to the MRA to confirm the diagnosis. And we are waiting for the sample. According to Madam, uh, she said uh, within three days, uh, these samples has been processed and results are ready. But actual situation in Jaffna, because uh, this uh, base hospital point be true, the samples are going through the uh, uh, teaching hospital Jaffna uh, through the ambulance and it, it will be handed over to the MRI. But we couldn't able to get the results in a uh, uh, very short time because sometimes we may, uh, I think uh, we got results after two weeks or one and a half weeks, near some time it may be one month even. So we are waiting for to vaccinate the children according to the results. So sometimes they may be age appropriate will be passed. So how how we we can get these uh, results? How can I tell the ICNO or these uh, hospital people to get down the some uh, results in time? Okay, thank you for this question. Actually, so everybody, uh, so many people are having actually this question, right? So even I think. Uh, our sir can remember that day. So, so much of even from the IDH, they had this question. But I think from the, as you are sending the samples, right? Some hospitals, they are very nicely, they are collecting when they are sending the samples, right? Through ambulance. Likewise, they are collecting the sample uh, reports also same way. But I think it is beyond our capacity. We are in the consultant level, laboratory consultant, right? So we are ready with the report. So I am very sorry to tell that. So the people who are sending the samples, you have to have a mechanism to collect the reports also because we have passed a huge epidemic also in the country, right? Likewise, so I think at that time, actually, we made a plant and we, because all the, we move our, all the staff to one, one, one go, one, one, I like COVID, right? Likewise, we can't do like that. Because of that, I think the hospital or MHO or whoever, they have to have a mechanism. So they have a mechanism to send the samples. But it is their responsibility, as you mentioned. You are waiting to treat the people, patients, right? So because of that, actually, you have to be alert of your report. So then please make a mechanism to get the reports again for that side also. So because it is out of control mind, because that is why I'm telling you, because we are loaded with the laboratory. Now for these two months, you can see actually one with one MLT I'm working and more than 500 samples. So how can I actually deliver to the doorstep for each? Because across the country, this is the only laboratory across the country we are getting. So I think it is hospital or whoever the a duty to make a mechanism to collect the sample because you have a collect the report. You have a mechanism to collect the uh, getting the bring the sample, something like that. Same ambulance can collect the reports also, right? Some hospitals, even Sarapit here, even Jatna Hospital, Jatna Teaching Hospital, they are doing that. I know. So, likewise, so in otherwise, I don't know what I can do actually. So, very sorry about to tell this. Can we have a mechanism through sent through the mail of that hospital about the results? Yeah, we can. We can make a, uh, you mean email, right? Yes, email, yes. Yes, yeah, so to the hospital can, mail, if you dispatch yes. those things, it's easy for us. Yeah. In, the case, in that case, actually, we can't actually send the report, just a table like thing, only the results, right? Just yes, a, like that's that's enough. Because yeah. we can trace from the BHT and we can trace yeah. it from these so those then hospitals. We can have a focal point and then we can do that way. Yes. So I can tell uh, that hospital ICNO to sp speak with MRA and make some arrangements to, to get the mail, isn't it? Uh, there is another comment uh, by Dr. Jude Jayamaha, just to echo. Dr. BJC says comment on SSP high incidence when infected less than one year, there will be an outbreak of SSP in 10 years' time. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As, as I indicated earlier, the risk is there, but I think the, the exact figures are subject to very many other confounding factors. Because although, you know, these, these risks and incidence figures that people give for these things, say one in 5,500, you don't know which one would put in, fit into this uh, one. one. Uh, so it's very difficult. But I think there is always a risk of an increase of cases. 
I think that should be sent out. Yes. Yeah, Janaki, one other thing that you did mention about the timing of the samples. Yes. I think that has to be really sent in the form of a circular or something like that uh, to all the institutions. I don't know whether that is possible. Giving the ideal times at which the samples should be collected. Is that possible? Yes, sir, it is possible. Then there, can you remember, sir, in the advisory committee, right? Committee advisory committee meeting, Muted. DG asked to make another new circular. Oh, yeah. So the same day, sir, I sent this guide guide to the people who are making uh, circular. So I don't know what is happening. So any other, right. you can recommend me any okay. other way. So I can send you this guide, please. Uh, Janki, uh, as a college of college, can we make sort of a guideline and give it to, uh, as a circular to the ministry? Your pediatric yeah. college? Yes, I can send you so then you can make a circular, no problem because I just want to give, give this guide to everybody because not to actually uh, send the false sample. So that whoever do it is fine. So yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. yeah but Janaki, if you send it, send it to us in the college. Right, I'll send to Dr. Kosala. We, 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 can, uh, we can disseminate it to all our members and that will cover all the important uh, sort of components of people who would actually be sending the, the samples. So we can do that easily. Right, sir. I'll do that today, sir. Uh, any, any other questions? Thank you, sir. Huh? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, then uh, thank you very much, uh, both the speakers, uh, for that really, I mean, very enlightening uh, presentations they made. And 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 to and I must uh, thanks uh, Dr. Janaki uh, for that. Uh, I mean, giving us statistics about the real situation of uh, measles in the country, because I mean, even as pediatricians, we were not that aware that it's it's a. I know that it's an outbreak, but it looks, uh, I mean, by your figures, it's a more than outbreak. Uh, I, I think, thank you very much for enlightening us. I think we should uh, be very, uh, I mean, surveillance-wise, we should have a system to uh, uh, curb this uh, uh, outbreak. And thank you very much for joining everyone. And let's hope that we can uh, uh, get go ahead and make a good guideline through the college and disseminate among our members at least. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much.